Joining me now, Executive Director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, Savita Pandey, and President and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, Krish Omara Vignaraja. Savita, CNBC's Steve Sedgwick spoke with Samantha Power, the USAID Administrator, and here is what she had to say about the refugee situation at Poland's border. Take a listen. It's very serious. I mean, obviously, families are backed up for 25, 29 hours in some places. Um, the numbers coming over are increasing by 30, 40, 50 percent every day. And it stems from Putin's increasing brutality and the way he has sent missiles and shell fire and tanks into civilian centers. Savita, talk to us about this reality. What are Ukraine's neighbors doing to prepare for this influx of refugees? I think they're doing a great job in terms of sort of just showing the willingness to accept refugees. I mean, in the past, we have seen countries like Poland and Hungary being very reluctant to sort of deal with uh, the refugee influx, which is coming in from Syria. So it's a very welcome development that they are announcing that they're welcoming refugees. They're opening centers to welcome them. But the other thing that we all have to remember is that Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe. There are 44 million people who live there. And as of now, around 150,000 have crossed the borders. But there are millions living in these cities which are under siege right now, where uh, the Russians are indiscriminately shelling. They're using ballistic missiles and explosive weapons with wide impact radius. So we also have to be concerned about people who are um, staying put, who are unable to leave, have taken refuge in subway stations or uh, are, um, you know, hiding under bomb shelters. And we have to be concerned about those people because as the fighting sort of becomes a street to street, uh, civilians will be caught in the crossfire. And as we have seen with urban warfare and uh, um, modern warfare, uh, civilians pay the highest price. And, you know, as you just mentioned before, that men have not been allowed to leave. That means families have been torn apart. But um, the, the men who have taken up arms, these are these are not combatants, these are not trained soldiers, these are doctors and teachers and uh, and engineers who, who are just like you and me. So we have to think about people who are staying put and the kind of impact um, this crisis is going to have uh, on those people and the, the humanitarian consequences are of that are going to be really catastrophic. Krish, to Savita's point, this, this isn't even the tip of the iceberg. In that same exchange with CNBC, Powers was asked about a number estimating about 5 million potential refugees. She contended that while it is still early, that number sounded about accurate to her. Again, speaking to Savita's point about the sheer population size of the Ukraine, Krish, I am sure you have seen this because it seems every mom in America has seen this. The New York Times had video of newborns in a hospital in Ukraine being cared for underground because they needed to seek refuge um, from, from firing that was happening overhead. There is still much more to come. There are still people like the mothers of these babies, these babies themselves who have not yet had an opportunity probably to even figure out, Krish, what they are going to do next. I say all of that to say we have talked about Europe's responsibility. What is the United States' responsibilities, Krish? Yeah, so we know that it's bad and it is going to get worse. Um, we know that this is the beginning of a massive refugee crisis, the likes of which we may not have seen in Europe since World War II. Um, I think one of the most important things for us to understand is when Russia's, uh, you know, they in illegally annexed Crimea in 2014, that resulted in about 2 million who were uh, fleeing their homes. 90% of those were women, children, and the elderly. And this is where we know that neighboring nations like Poland and Moldova and Hungary will receive um, a significant number of these refugees, uh, but we know that they also don't have the infrastructure to handle it themselves. And so that's why it's critically important that the international community 
be there to surge operational support to the region to help with refugee processing to meet basic needs. Um, we've seen a first step in terms of the U.S. and the role that we can play from here uh, by sending 5,000 American troops to Poland to assist with displaced Ukrainians, but we know that this is only going to grow. And that's where it is great that the White House has asked Congress to approve uh, $6.4 billion. Um, about half of that would be for humanitarian assistance. But I really want to stress that this is where the U.S. needs to lead by example. Like NATO, the refugee resettlement system was forged in the crucible of the Cold War. And so while Europe is going to bear the brunt of this refugee crisis, the U.S. must repurpose the capacity that we've rebuilt to welcome Afghans to help provide safe haven to some of the Ukrainians most vulnerable. And I think that is our responsibility, and we need to lead by example. Savita, this is your first time on the program, but Krish and I have sat here many times talking about refugees the world over, talking about those who have come from Afghanistan, those seeking refuge from Central America. Now we are sitting here talking about refugees fleeing their home in Ukraine. I just spoke with uh, Congresswoman Jacobs of California. I asked her about temporary protected status being issued for Ukrainians. She contended that as important as that might be, what is even more important is lifting the cap on refugees. Your thoughts, Savita? No, you're absolutely right, and, and so is the Congresswoman. I think that it's so important to sort of activate the humanitarian parole system, which was activated uh, for Afghanistan, where you were able to bring in refugees, and, and these people are then allowed to work and, and sort of start or uh, start a semblance of a normal life. So it's very important. And my organization, which works on the idea of responsibility to protect, it's about protecting populations from the four crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. And what we will see uh, more and more in Ukraine is the commission of, of war crimes if the Russians do not um, adhere to the international humanitarian law, the indiscriminate shelling, the sort of targeting of civilian um, infrastructure. And, and, and that in itself um, it will lead to more refugees leaving the country, crossing the border. So in that context, it is the responsibility of the international community to provide refuge to these people who are uh, escaping um, and, and leaving their country, not because they, they want to, it's because they're being forced um, uh, of the bombs falling from the, the sky. Um, and again, I mean, just to underline the point that um, it is very important that we create the right kind of uh, refugee infrastructures to receive them, to sort of, you know, make them um, feel welcome in the countries that they're landing in. But sort of the broader question also is that um, how can we help the, the those who will not be able to leave, and that includes the elderly, the differently abled, um, the critically ill. Uh, the other sort of aspect in this entire crisis is COVID-19. Um, the, the rates of vaccination in Ukraine are not that high. So how are we receiving those populations? What are we doing with them? So there are all of these different questions that are going to come in as this crisis um, goes on and continues on with no um, the possibility of a ceasefire. Savita Pandey, Krish Omara, Vignoraja, thank you both so much.